then a registration into the slave registers, the pauper registers, even today, to ensure that we are disenfranchised of our rightful heir, of our, of our rightful property. It is not something that can unlock wealth. You cannot unlock the wealth that is the private system. That is the private system's own security. That is the private system's own use of it. What you can do, and what I hope everyone will do, is take control of their own estate. But to you and to the public, the birth certificate is nothing more than a modern version of the pauper certificate. So residency is the first form of control. Now, the second form of control is this concept of citizenship. And when you read the history books, they talk about citizenship of Rome and citizenship of Athens. In reality, the concept of citizenship came from the 19th century. And in fact, the word is identified as coming from the 19th century. And yet all the history books create the image and the impression that citizenship was a concept created back in ancient Rome. Complete and utter rubbish. Concept of, of the citizen in our perspective is one who is receiving a benefit. One who is receiving a benefit from the estate, from the common estate. Now, citizenship may be identified in different ways in different places. In most places, it's identified through some kind of uh, health identity or an education identity, or if you are in America, the Social Security provides not only uh, the identification of uh, citizenship, but it also identifies uh, your employee number, which we'll get to in a moment. But citizenship is a second form of control and presumptions. And it is important to identify these different levels of control because it gives us an insight into how parts of the system think about us. Let's go back to the first one, the concept of the resident, before we get back to the concept of citizen. Let's look at how the knowledge of resident plays out if we ever go to a magistrate's court. Now, for this analogy, I'm going to ask you to think about the scene, if you've hopefully seen that scene, a famous scene that was repeated in Indiana Jones of the great warehouse in which all the secret government files are placed. This warehouse so large you can't see the end of it. So think of that warehouse for a moment, that image of that warehouse full of millions and millions of boxes. At one end of that warehouse, imagine an office. And that office is called the registrar. Now, when they first created birth certificates in the 1830s, the registrar, being the clerk of the county, the clerk of the council, being the clerk of the guardians, being the registrar of the court of public record, also was the custos rota lorum. And in the acts that were repeated right throughout the Western world, the registrar is considered to be in custody of the name. So the name that is on your birth certificate legally is considered to be in custody with the registrar. Now, the warehouse is the wards. The warehouse is the county. And you are a good. You are a property. So the name of the property is already in custody and the good, being you, is somewhere in that warehouse. And the proof that it is in that huge warehouse is the address, is the residential address. So let's just think about that concept for a moment. The name is in custody already. 
The residential address says that it is within the jurisdiction of a giant warehouse of that registrar and that the goods are on some shelf in some aisle somewhere in that massive warehouse and they only have to go and find it. And of course, if it's dangerous goods, they can send some of their special uh, warehouse staff in Velcro and, and guns to go and collect it, a SWAT team, but it's somewhere in that warehouse. That's the power of residency, and that's why magistrates and at local courts and police have no problems in getting their head around the concept. It's very simple for them to be expressed. It's not rocket science to express it to them. The name is in custody. If you have a residential address and you're somewhere in that warehouse, they've just got to go and find the goods. If they don't have a residential address, they can't issue a warrant. If they don't have a residential address, then fundamentally you're not in the warehouse. You're not in their corporate government warehouse. That is why on the One Heaven site, we've created the location structure, the trust numbers, and while we have university and province, while we have campus. This structure is not only a political structure, an education structure, but it is a proof by trust that as a member of One Heaven, you are not in that warehouse. Now, you can go to the extent of saying you're on some minor outlying island. You can go to the extent of saying I'm on planet Earth. You can do that. Or you can use the structure that we've provided to identify that you are not in that warehouse. You are somewhere else. We'll, we'll take some more time on this in coming days and there'll be updated notes on this in terms of how to make clear the fact that you are not a good in that warehouse. You do not have a residential address to match up to the custody of your name. So that's the first point, resident, residency. And that knowledge is known well by the police, it's known well by the magistrates, it's known well by uh, the sheriffs, and that is one of the key things of control. Why they feel happy to issue warrants, summons, why they feel happy to come and bash your door down, why they feel happy to put us in prison. Let's go back to this citizenship. The citizenship aspect is the concept that we're receiving a benefit. And if we're receiving a benefit, then we are uh, a recipient, that we are a dependent on them. And if we're a dependent, then they are the guardians and we are the dependent. Now, this concept of dependency and control is why the judges and why people in authority are happy to consider us as children because they are giving us benefits that we accept. It's also why they are happy to consider that benefits and receiving benefits is proof of being in a form of contract, that we are obligated to perform the conditions of those benefits and why they are happy to jump on us if we seem to deviate from those benefits, even though citizenship now is citizenship to a private corporation and not to the government and not to the original du jour state. So that's a second form of control. Now the third form of control, and this has been raised time and time again, is the concept uh, that we are an employee. And this comes in by the age of majority. What does a driver's license do? It does a number of things. But a driver's license is, in essence, proof, ID, your government employee ID. Your social security number is, in essence, proof that you are a government employee. And this is the presumption, I might add. Because the, the presumption is that these things identify you as an employee and they have arguments for that. But of course, if you were an employee, then you would be receiving a wage. There would be a payroll record. So these presumptions can be knocked on the head by simply challenging the presumption in the most logical way, in a way that they might understand. If there isn't a payroll receipt, if there isn't a payment, then clearly you can't be receiving. Or if you have been receiving a wage and you have got a payroll in some trust structure and they haven't revealed it to you, then they've been withholding 
this benefit to you, this wealth to you. And they're in a whole lot of trouble. But as it stands, government departments are more than happy to send you demand notices to compel you to perform duties because it is all based on the presumption of control that you are an employee. And this is especially the case uh, when you are considering groups, whether it be the uh, tax or council, whether it be uh, different uh, environmental groups that are now seeking to enforce um, standards on you because you're considered a government employee. And then let's talk about tax. Tax it isn't simply based, well, it's certainly based, one of its key presumptions is based that you're a government employee, but it's based on a further control, and that is, of course, the registration. Now, we've mentioned registration of the tax file number before, but let me say it to you again. When they twisted the laws so that we became enemies of the state, we became enemy aliens, the tax file number effectively means that we are a registered criminal, that we have registered ourselves to them to state that we will be committing enemy acts and that what the tax department does each year is require us to effectively uh, confess through self-assessment. And if we confess through self-assessment, we are given a minor fine. But if we don't confess as registered criminals, then they are given by our registration the right to come after us for each year, each year being a trust, that we have not declared. Now what this does is this overcomes the uh, presumption that um, we should only pay, can only pay if we have some kind of contract and have done uh, some kind of consideration, some kind of agreement. Our registration is a, is a key component for tax. Of course, the presumption of the tax department can be dealt with apart from challenging the registration, but also by saying, prove to us each year, show us the contract that we have entered into, show us the consideration, show us the penalties. The last thing the tax department wants to reveal is the very nature of how tax is enforced by making us all criminals. That's the last thing the tax department wants to do, to show that the reason tax is able to do what they do is because it is treated as if we are all registered criminals. It's treated as if we're all registered sex offenders. That's ultimately what the tax register has done. If that ever became public knowledge, if that was ever understood by the general man and woman who believes that they are paying, rightly so, contributing to their society, then there would be absolute outrage. So again, this is a, a function of control. So each part of their system has their own special domain of knowledge that they use to control us. In the magistrates, in the police, it's this concept of the giant warehouse that we're a good located in some aisle, a residential address telling them where to find the good, that our name, being the title, being the ownership, is back in the home office there, in custody. We see the, the guardianship powers through the receiving of benefits as a citizen. We see the agents of the departments being able to force us to do things because we're considered a government employee and the most um, aggressive of government departments demanding that we pay money in terms of the tax because we are registered and if we're registered we are a registered criminal because we are performing criminal acts every year by using their property. Well a key part of all of this is to clean up the mess and establish our standing. And last week, what we spoke about was the key presumption of being intestate. That if we are intestate and we are, do not have a will, then we have no standing. We explained that if you go and look at probate and understand the structures of probate, 
a court under probate appointed 